Thanks, everybody, for coming. My name is John Ludlow. I'm one of the urologists across the street at Western Michigan Urological Associates. And we're part of Holland Hospital. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about vascular health as it relates to urology. And it's something we don't typically think about in urology. My training is primarily in urologic cancers and urologic reconstruction. And I trained down at uh, Indiana University. And Indiana University is a big urologic cancer center. Um, and one of the things the chairman of the urology, John Donahue, used to say to us when we were residents was, you have to focus not only on treating a patient's cancer, but treating the side effects of those treatments. And erectile dysfunction was one of those. And that's kind of how I got interested in reconstruction and, and erectile dysfunction. So tonight I'm going to talk about vascular health and urology. Um, my approach in talk, doing these talks is, is a low-key approach. If you have questions during, ask, ask them. Um, all questions are good questions. There's, there are no stupid questions. So the questions you have are important. Ask them. And I'll stick around afterwards. We can have a question and answer session as well. So I want to start out about uh, describing a patient that I had not that long ago. This is a patient uh, who's 45 years old, and I saw him... And his primary complaint when he came to me was erectile dysfunction. Uh, he had a long history of diabetes mellitus, but kept really good care of himself. This, this gentleman was not overweight. He ate well. He followed his sugars very well. He exercised daily. Uh, and he was the, uh, the pinnacle of health. You looked at this guy and you said, You're, you have nothing wrong with you. And in fact, he had uh, insulin-dependent diabetes for 20 years. Um, he had gone to other places to have his erectile dysfunction treated and uh, wasn't very, very successful. Uh, and when he came to me, he was considering surgery for correction of his erectile dysfunction. And I'm going to leave it at that for a moment. And I'm going to step back and go ahead and talk about some other things. And we'll come back to him in the, in the near future here. So erectile dysfunction isn't simply a lifestyle issue. We know that. We used to think it was just a lifestyle issue. It's a medical problem, just like diabetes, or high blood pressure, or high cholesterol, or cancer, or anything like, uh, like, like that. Um, in the last 10 years, we, we've come to understand the significance of erectile dysfunction as a disease process. 20 years ago, again, we thought this was a lifestyle issue. What we're understanding now is that erectile dysfunction can be the sign of other significant medical issues. And it's important that we understand that as physicians, and it's important that you understand that as patients. Um, the bottom line is that erectile dysfunction can be the sign of other significant medical problems. And again, you and us should know that. that that's important. So today, the key concepts in erectile dysfunction, um, number one, expanding incidence. There are more and more people are presenting today with erectile dysfunction. Uh, Ten years ago, we said about 20, 25 million men in the United States had erectile dysfunction. Now we think it's upwards of 45 to 50 million. And actually, I think that a large part of this is that people are presenting themselves with this and complaining about it rather than, um, uh, rather than there being a change in the incidence. I, I, think, I think this has been around for a long time. We know that. Um, but we're starting to ask about it. Patients are becoming aware of it, um, all, to, all to the benefit of their health. Early diagnosis with erectile dysfunction is very important because early diagnosis can lead to better treatments. Uh, it's endothelial dysfunction. Endothelium, the endothelium is the lining of blood vessels. And endothelial dysfunction leads to erectile dysfunction. No two ways about it. Um, it also leads to stroke and heart attack and peripheral vascular disease as well. Exercise and diet are extremely important. We sort of forget that. When we talk about treatment options for this disease process, exercise and diet are extremely important. And we should talk about those first and foremost. There are effective drugs and there are effective other treatments. And we know that men with erectile dysfunction are at higher risk of early death from other vascular diseases. So those are the key concepts. Um, the goals today, number one, understand the significance of erectile dysfunction. Again, it's not a lifestyle issue. Understand why men develop it, the evaluation, the treatment options that are available. And I, I'd like patients to understand why I think erectile dysfunction is a disease process no different than any other disease process that we see. I think that's important. So some common facts that we've seen. 35% um, of men age 40 to 70 have erectile dysfunction. This is a numbers from a few years ago, um, and that's probably just a little bit low in my mind. I, I actually think there's, a, there's a, a higher incidence. It's upwards towards 45% uh, 
I think. So I think that this number is probably a little bit low. We know that the risk of ED or erectile dysfunction rises sharply with age. So the older we get, the more likely we're going to have this disease process. Um, there's a three, uh, three or four-fold greater prevalence in men ages 50 to 59 versus younger ages. So we're talking about tripling, quadrupling this, the incidence of erectile dysfunction as men age. 600,000 new cases that we're seeing. And uh, th th this is probably the most important concept here. How many are undiagnosed? Again, it's incumbent upon us to ask men when we see them in the office. It's incumbent upon us to ask them about this disease process. It's, in, it's incumbent upon you to ask us about it as well. I think that's uh, a key concept here. Um, we know the prevalence of sexual dysfunction in the United States is significant. There was a National Health and Social Life Survey. This is a long time ago. A lot of people um, in, this, in this survey, almost 50% of men and 30, or 50% of women and 35% uh, of men complained of some degree of sexual dysfunction. So uh, many years ago, it was a significant problem. Now, so it's a, it's a more significant problem. And part of that is the expanding um, uh, baby boomer population. You know, the percentage of people that are in their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s has increased significantly over the past few years. So, I, and I'm seeing a lot more patients in my practice who are, who are in that baby boomer generation. So what's the definition of erectile dysfunction? That's important, we have to have a definition. Erectile dysfunction is the inability to get and maintain an erection to complete sexual intercourse to the satisfaction of both partners. This is a couple's disease. It's not just a men's disease, it's a couple's disease. Um, and it, when I see patients in the office, my preference is to see couples, not just men who come in and their wives are at home or, or their significant others who are at home. It's, it's, it's much preferable for me to see patients um, and their significant others in the office. I think, that, I think that's very important. So let's look at erectile dysfunction. And first of all, let's understand normal erectile dysfunction because I think that's a hallmark of things. I think it's important that we understand wh what it takes to get an erection. And it, it, it makes it easier to understand why we have it. Um, blood flow, nerve function, and hormonal function are the three hallmarks. Number one, you gotta get the blood to the penis. No two ways about it. It's gotta get there and it's gotta stay there. And both of those can be problems. Both getting and it staying there can be problems. Nerve function is extremely important as well. We know there are nerves that go down that, that, that course behind the prostate and go to the penis. Those are called the parasympathetic nerves and those have to be intact. They're damaged in men who've had prostate surgery or radiation therapy, men who have had rectal cancer surgery or pelvic surgery, and they're significantly damaged in men who are diabetics. So diabetes is that, that one disease process that I see quite frequently. And then hormonal function is important as well. And by hormonal function, I'm talking about testosterone. And testosterone has been this pendulum. So 25 years ago, men who came in and complaining of erectile dysfunction were automatically treated with testosterone replacement. And a lot of those patients didn't need testosterone replacement. They weren't really evaluated and they were given testosterone in, in, incorrectly. And then about uh, 15 years ago, the pendulum kind of was swinging the other way and it said, we were told we don't need testosterone. It was overblown, it causes too many problems, it can cause prostate cancer, it causes prostate growth, it can cause other significant issues, we shouldn't give men testosterone. Now the pendulum is back again and we're talking about aggressively identifying men who have low testosterone and who need to be treated. And I would agree wholeheartedly with that concept. I think there's too many men out there that have low testosterone that need treatment. And testosterone is, is extremely important, not only in, in sexual dysfunction and sexual function, uh, it's also um, extremely important in general, general health, in our bone health, our vascular health, prevention of diabetes, muscular health, mental well-being. So testosterone is extremely important, and it's, uh, it, it, has to be, it has to be measured correctly and given correctly. So hormonal function is, is one of those, um, the, the, those parts of this whole process that, um, that, that is a little bit new and a little bit um, um, uh, some misinformation, and I think it's an important process of things. Uh, there's some newer research that's looking at central nervous system neurotransmitters. So those are things in the brain that are released during sexual stimulation. And what we know about these, these uh, neurotransmitters is that they can be very important in promoting overall vascular health in men. 
there's been a lot of research going into identifying these and knowing, um, uh, being able to, uh, to, to measure the levels correctly. And at one point in time, we're going to talk about um, replacing them in men. We're also looking at some, some genetic studies, identifying men who have, who have low levels um, for a longer period of time who are at a higher risk of other vascular events like heart attack and stroke. What we do know is that most erectile dysfunction is due to blood flow issues. That is the number one, and that's the hallmark of, of, of today's discussion. So let's talk about blood flow for a second. This is sort of a, um, a scattered diagram here. But what this is is the male pelvis. This is the male skeleton here, and this is the vasculature of the male pelvis. This is the key blood vessel that supplies blood to the penis. There are two of them. So this is one sided, there's another side over here. And uh, this is the hallmark artery that needs to be open and needs to deliver blood flow to the penis, the internal pudendal artery. Um, some studies were done in the mid 80s by uh, uh, a physician at Johns Hopkins and, and he looked intimately at this, this artery. He looked at it primarily in relation to the prostate and to blood flow to the prostate. And he did some really elegant studies over in Austria looking at cross sections of, of cadavers. And it was his um, estimation that about three to five percent of people are only born with one internal pudendal artery rather than two. With the advent of robotic surgery, what we now know based on robotic surgery and some other more elegant um, x-ray studies, probably about 30 to 35 percent of men only have one internal pudendal artery. So they're already have, they already have an issue from the get-go. Um, and that's some new data that, that, that is important from our standpoint. It's important when we talk to men about prostate surgery and prostate cancer and the things that they have to ex expect after prostate cancer and prostate surgery. Um, the internal pudendal arteries basically branch into three, three segments that supply blood to the corporal bodies, and these are actually the erectile bodies, as well as to the, the corpus spongiosum here, which is essentially the urethra. That's the tube through which we urinate. So really, th th this is a good diagram that describes the penis. If I take the penis apart, and I can do that in certain surgical procedures, there are three important parts. There is an erectile body on one side, an erectile body on the other side, and the corpus spongiosum, which supplies the urethra or the urinary tube. So having a, a, a good blood supply to all three of these structures is important in normal erectile function. So again, what we're talking about is blood flow. These arteries have to be open. Um, they have to, be, uh, have, have to transmit blood throughout the penis for, for men to be able to get and maintain their erection. And what we know is that these blood vessels, those two internal penile arteries right here, are very small. They're less than two millimeters in diameter. And can you, you, you can imagine that with issues with diet and lack of exercise and smoking and high cholesterol, uh, that these can become narrowed relatively quickly. And that's somewhat of the predictor of other medical issues. If you're getting blood vessel narrowing here, as is evidenced by erectile dysfunction, you're probably getting blood vessel narrow, narrowing in your heart and up to your, to your brain as well. And that's the hallmark of, of erectile dysfunction and its, and its relationship to other vascular diseases. The fact that these are so small means that they're much more vulnerable to the things that we do to ourselves and to our genetic predisposition to vascular diseases. So um, I, again, th this, this is the, the most important artery that I see in my practice when it comes to erectile dysfunction. You can. That's a good question. Um, one of the problems with that is that the insurance companies don't want to pay for that test because their claim is that it doesn't matter. If there's narrowing of those blood vessels, that's not going to impact anything when it comes to me treating you. I'm still likely going to treat you the same way. Um, what, I, what I have been able to do with some of the insurance companies is is help them understand that there are certain situations where it's beneficial for men to be evaluated. And it's basically an angiogram like, uh, like a, an angiogram of the heart, a coronary artery angiogram. It's very similar. So we can do some, some um, x-rays of those blood vessels. 
It has to be done in conjunction with some provocative testing, meaning I've got to give in, an injection of a medication to the patient that increases blood flow. And we want to look at changes both before and afterwards to see how, how significant things are. Um, there are a couple of centers in the United States right now that are actually stenting the internal pudendal artery. And the only way that you're going to stent the internal pudendal artery like you, like you stent a coronary artery is with, a blood, is, is, is with an angiogram or a, an, an x-ray test like that. So right now the insurance companies are a little bit um, uh, reluctant to pay for this, um, especially in, in, in this climate. Yeah, so the, the, the question is, if you have coronary artery disease, can you, can you then check for that? Um, can you do this, this, this x-ray? And, and still, the insurance companies are, are going are gonna to balk at that for the most part. There are, there are um, some situations where if I, do, if I communicate with the insurers directly um, and there's a specific reason to do it, yes. What they'll tell me, uh, and I've talked to a lot of the insurers about men who present to me with erectile dysfunction and that being a, a, a reasonable um, a referral to a cardiologist. In the past they would say absolutely not, erectile dysfunction doesn't mean anything, it's a lifestyle issue and, and now they're starting to understand that with, with the data that's out, especially over the last five years, that it's reasonable for men who, who present with erectile dysfunction to have a, a, a paid referral to a cardiologist. So. Those are good questions. Um, again, blood flow is the, is the number one issue that we're talking about. And we talked about blood flow in. This is obviously an important issue. But what about blood flow out, also known as venous leak or venous outflow disorder? So one of the things that I'll see in my practice frequently is men who come in and they, they'll, they'll tell me that they are able to get an erection without difficulties. But when they start to become intimate, they lose their erection. And that can be extremely frustrating. And what we, what we know is that, is that the, the outflow um, increases, the number of blood vessels increase both in size and diameter. And although blood is flowing in, it's flowing right back out. It's akin to not putting a, a stopper in your tub correctly. You can turn that spigot on as, as hard as you want, but you're not going to fill that tub. Um, this is a very common process and it's very, very frustrating. It's significantly associated with diabetes and prostate cancer treatment. I'll see a lot of men who've had prostate cancer and prostate removal um, who suffer from venous outflow disorder. And it's, it's, a, it's a very frustrating um, um, form of erectile dysfunction. So not only is blood flow in important, blood flow out is very important as well. And this is the diagram of the, of the veins that drain the penis. And what we know is that men who, especially men who are diabetics, these blood vessels increase significantly in number and caliber. Uh, there's a physician in, in San Francisco, at UC San Francisco, Tom Liu, who, um, who's done quite a bit of work in, in venous outflow disorder. And what he did was he took about 30 patients and did a very elegant surgery with a microscope where he tied off these little blood vessels. And this, this was tying off upwards of 250 blood vessels in one patient. It took four hours under an anesthetic. It was a significant operative procedure. Um, and what, what we found was that men had significant improvement in their erectile function, their ability to maintain their erections for the next three to six months. And then subsequent to that, they probably had some regrowth of these blood vessels and they lost that ability. So right now there's a, an unknown provocative agent in men who are diabetics and men who are, are, have had prostate cancer that promotes the growth of these blood vessels. And we don't know what that agent is, but it promotes the growth and the number and it, it can be very frustrating. Um, if we I could identify this, and there are some genetic studies that are looking into this, uh, some genetic markers, um, that, that would be a big, big plus for patients with diabetes or patients who've had their prostates removed as far as treating their erectile dysfunction. So number two is nerve function. And the most important nerves that we see in the pelvis are the parasympathetic nerves. Um, those are the nerves that are located deep in the pelvis. Uh, they course between the prostate and the rectum. So they're very deep inside and we can see them um, nicely with robotic surgery. They are damaged during prostate or rectal surgery or with radiation therapy. 
And what we know is that these nerves, when they're damaged from diabetes, that damage is probably irreversible. Uh, it's such a profound effect on the little tiny blood vessels that supply these nerves in men who have, di who have diabetes, that that's an irreversible, pro irreversible process. And I think that's why diabetics are a much more difficult group of patients to treat when it comes to erectile dysfunction. So this is sort of a, um, unfortunately this, this slide didn't come out very well. Um, but the, the, the nerves course, here's the bladder in the pelvis, here's the prostate, and these nerves sit right down here. When we, um, when, when we do surgery, we can identify those nerves, but those nerves are the size of a human hair in most patients, and they're, they're, extremely, um, they're extremely fragile, and they, 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 can, they can be torn or stretched inadvertently and ir irreversibly damaged. Um, and, and again, prostate surgery is one of the key things. You know, when, when we used to do prostate removal with an open procedure, meaning we'd make an incision, we would push and pull on the prostate constantly. And although we could identify the nerves and we could separate the nerves from the prostate, during that process, we inadvertently stretched these nerves to the point where they were damaged irreversibly. We don't really cut the nerves or cauterize them. Um, during those procedures, but we, we, we stretched them. And that's, that, that, that traumatic um, event to those nerves was, uh, did create an irreversible issue. What we know is that during robotic surgery, we're much better able to keep those nerves intact and avoid damage. So the, the robotic surgery allows much clearer visualization and much less damage to those nerves. With that being said, we're still seeing significant amounts of erectile dysfunction in men who have their prostates removed robotically. So we're not where we want to be from the standpoint of surgically preserving those nerves during, uh, during prostate surgery, but we're getting there. Um, what we know that is, that is important is that penile physical therapy is important and grossly underutilized as far as repairing these nerves. So if you think about it in, in another way, if a nerve is damaged, if a, ner if a nerve on your arm is damaged, um, the, the, the quarterback for the University of Michigan, Denard Robinson, damaged his ulnar nerve, and his, his, hand, his fingers were numb and he couldn't play football. Um, but he didn't just sit around and wait for things to get better. He went through intensive physical therapy and, and, and eventually he's gotten better. Um, the same goes for the nerves, the parasympathetic nerves in the pelvis after somebody has their prostate removed. If we just say, well, keep an eye on things and we'll see what happens, guaranteed you're not going to get better. If there are things that we can do, physical therapy things we can do, I call it penile physical therapy. Sounds kind of odd, but it's, it's a, um, there, there are things that we can do to support those nerves and to help those nerves heal and to regenerate those nerves over time. It can take a long time, but it's, it's, it's a better option than just letting things go. So penile physical therapy, a little bit odd, and it sounds a little bit unusual, but it's an important adjunct to treating men who have had um, prostate removal. You know, the, 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 I have patients that are diabetics or who have other medical issues that lead to nerve damage. Um, those patients, unfortunately, don't respond to physical therapy like men who have had their prostates removed. So although it's an option, it's something that doesn't work as well, uh, um, and unfortunately. So the third adjunct, or the third hallmark of, of normal erectile function is, um, normal erectile function is testosterone and hormonal function. Again, relatively poorly studied until about five years ago. Even today, when, when I look at men and measure their testosterone levels, the range of a normal testosterone is from about 175 to eight or 900. And all of those studies were done about uh, 17 years ago and looked at healthy 20 and 30 year old men. Um, and I, I'm looking around, I don't see any 20 or 30 year old men here. Um, so for me to measure your testosterone at the age of 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 and compare that to a healthy 20 year old doesn't make a lot of sense in my book. Um, so I would tell you that we don't really know what a normal testosterone is at this point in time. We have some ideas, um, but I can tell you that if your testosterone is 200 and that's deemed normal by the insurance companies, um, most men will see significant improvement in a large segment of their lives with testosterone replacement. Um, so 
Understanding and, and knowing that, that this has been poorly studied, we're doing some things about that. We're, we're, we're gathering data as we speak to look at men in, in, in their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and trying to figure out what the norms are in those age populations. There's lots of misinformation about testosterone and testosterone replacement and hormonal therapy. You know, this notion that, that testosterone supplementation can cause prostate cancer. Um, there's no proof of that. There's never been any studies that even closely show that there's any association with testosterone and, and the development of prostate cancer. What we do know is that there are certain types of prostate cancer that respond to taking the testosterone away, but testosterone does not promote prostate cancer by any means. Um, and there, I have plenty of patients that have been treated for prostate cancer or have a known diagnosis of prostate cancer and aren't being actively treated who we have replaced testosterone in. So when you think about that, I, I, I can think of uh, 10 men in my practice who have a diagnosis of prostate cancer, have received no treatment, we're just, we're just following them, which is important because I think there's a, there's a subgroup of prostate cancer patients that don't need treatment, who have low testosterones, and we've given them testosterone supplementation. And we followed them with prostate biopsies and PSAs, and there's been no change. So testosterone supplementation doesn't promote prostate cancer. I, that, that's a pretty definitive statement. I still see a lot of physicians that don't want to give patients prost uh, testosterone replacement because of the fear of, of promoting prostate cancer, and that's really a, a, an error. Um, as far as testosterone supplementation, there are a lot of treatment options available, both natural and, and, and otherwise. Um, Testosterone plays a key role in overall health, and that's important. And we know that men with, with chronically low testosterones have a, a, a higher risk of cardiac death than those with normal testosterones. And that information was discovered um, through patients that have been treated with, with testosterone removal who had prostate cancer. And it used to be that we would take testosterones away in men who had prostate cancer. And what we found in following those men over time is that they had a higher risk of heart attack and stroke and early death. So testosterone is an important thing, and it's something that we shouldn't ignore as physicians. So since 2008, there have been 12,500 published articles in peer-reviewed literature looking at hormonal function. So we're starting to make headway into this whole process. Um, prior to 2008, this number was about was less than 500. Again, we still don't know accurate data regarding normal values, and unfortunately there's no standardized lab assay, although Holland Hospital Spectrum, um, Metro, St. Mary's, um, the hospitals down in Kalamazoo and in Muskegon all measure testosterone with the same assay now. And that's an important, an important um, whenever I see patients with testosterone, testosterone levels, I always look at the assay, and it's got to be the, 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 the standard assay that, that, that we're recognizing now. So again, hormonal function, lots of misinformation. Testosterone doesn't cause prostate cancer. Uh, testosterone doesn't cause prostates to grow, leading to urinary problems. Testosterone is very necessary, uh, and testosterone doesn't cause liver cancer. So. Um, uh, again, testosterone, lots of misinformation, and it's, it's, a, it's an aspect of, of erectile dysfunction that's, that, that, that's extremely important. It's an aspect of our overall health that's extremely important. Yeah. So the, the question is, how do I decide who do I, who do I supplement when it comes to testosterone? Um, a couple of things that, that I look at. I, I want to I look at men's libido, their sexual function, um, whether they have depressive mood, Sometimes I'll look at their body habitus, their energy levels, and then I'll make a decision to, to measure testosterone in those men. And by, that, by one measurement, I will sometimes measure other parameters as well to figure out why their testosterone are low. Sometimes that's not always necessary. It, it's the, the whole process of understanding some, someone's hormonal function as it comes to testosterone can be very simple up front, and it can morph into this very complex um, uh, testing, usually blood testing, but sometimes x-rays of the brain, 
um, sometimes x-rays of other parts of the body to, to figure out why somebody has low testosterone. And then if they do have a low testosterone and are, and are symptomatic, I talk to them about the treatment options that are available to them. And there's a lot of different ways to, to supplement testosterone. One of the problems nowadays is, is the cost of testosterone replacement. It's, it's relatively inexpensive to come into my office every two weeks and get a shot. It's relatively inconvenient too. And it's not a very natural way to, to supplement testosterone, but it's, it's a necessary way. There are other options as well, but those can be a little bit more expensive and maybe not as, as effective and can have some other side effects. The gels and the patches and some of the pellets that we introduce. So uh, the, the, whole, the whole scheme of testosterone measuring and testosterone replacement uh, is fairly complicated, but it, it's a very safe process and, and we, we should be identifying men that have low testosterone levels. Yeah, the question is, what, what do we, how do we figure out what, what are the numbers that, that we need to go by? And that's a good question because the answer is really, the, the, the truthful answer is we're not sure. So I look at patients and I look at their numbers and I look at their symptoms. And, and a lot of those men will go on a short course of replacement therapy and see what sort of clinical response they have. In other words, do they have better energy level? Do they have a better libido? Do they have better erectile function? Um, is there less of a depressive mood? All of those are important parameters, and you have to spend some time talking to patients about those to figure out if there's a benefit there. Because you certainly don't want to replace someone's testosterone if they're not seeing a benefit. But your, your, your question is important because we don't really know what the norm is. And I don't mean to harp on the insurance companies, but the, uh, many times um, I'll see men who are, who are symptomatically hypogonadal. They have symptoms of low testosterone. They'll have a normal testosterone that's 200, which from my standpoint and everybody that, it, all of my colleagues who treat, who treat testosterone um, dysfunction would treat those men aggressively. And the insurance company will come back to me and say, he has a normal level. So it takes a little bit of legwork on my, I, I need to call the insurers and, and talk to them and explain things to them. You know, it's a little bit of a game that we have to play, unfortunately. But in, in, in many cases, it's, it's in the patient's best interest. So, Testosterone does a lot of things um, as, as it relates to erectile function. It's a good question. How does, how does, what, what does testosterone do for erectile function? It supports vascular health is probably the main thing. It makes the blood vessels do what the blood vessels are supposed to do. Now, you can have irreversible blood, blood vessel damage. Men who have had long-standing high blood pressure, cholesterol problems, who are smokers, those types of things. Men with low testosterone in that setting, they're probably not gonna see significant improvement in, in, their, in, their, um, in their blood flow as it, as, it, as it is with testosterone replacement. But they can see other things. What we know about testosterone is it has an inductive effect on the penile tissues. Um, I'm gonna go back here a second. These two structures here, these corporal bodies are extremely important and extremely delicate. And if you cut into a corporal body, it's filled with little blood vessels and smooth muscle. What we know is that men who have chronically low testosterones will lose those blood vessels and smooth muscle in those corporal erectile bodies here, and they can become scarred. In somebody that has a, a healthy corporal body, when I open that corporal body, it looks like pink, um, um, a, a delicate pink tissue. Um, and when, when I see somebody with low testosterone, I, I, when I open it up, it looks gray and ashen. So testosterone is very important to support the, 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 the functional um, uh, aspect of those two erectile bodies. We know that. There are also some central nervous system um, uh, parameters that can improve with testosterone replacement in men with erectile dysfunction as it relates to, to correcting that. That's a little bit cutting edge and it's a little bit new, but it's, it's probably something that's, that's important as well. So getting back to hormonal function uh, for a second, what are the treatment options here? Topicals, injectables, and pellets. These are things, these are gels that you rub on your skin every day. Uh, injectables are just things that we can, we inject people with. Um, the topicals, gels, and patches, they're expensive. 
transference is always a potential issue. So if I'm putting testosterone on every night when I go to sleep and I'm hugging my wife, uh, there's a possibility that I can get that testosterone on her. And the, the studies have been shown to prove that. So when my wife starts to shave with me in the morning, her face, um, that's a problem. So the topicals can be an issue when it comes to something like transfer transference. We also know that the topicals have a scent and they can be very irritating. Um, so the topicals are good and bad. You gotta put them on every day. Uh, which can be somewhat limiting for some patients. Not everybody is compliant when it comes to their medication. What about the injectables? Testosterone cypionate is the hallmark and, the, and the, 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 the standard treatment. A little bit inconvenient. You gotta come into my office every two weeks and get the shot. Uh, there are some side effects, although not significant. Um, it's not physiologic. So testosterone, we know, goes up in the morning, goes back down, goes back up in the afternoon. You know, we need testosterone in the morning. We want to feel good. We want to get up and we're going to get start moving. Same in the afternoon. We need that testosterone. That's important. When, when you come into my office every two weeks, I give you a big slug of testosterone. Your testosterone level goes way up and then it trails down over the next two weeks. So that's not very physiologic. So we have some work to do on how best to replace testosterone in men. There are some pellets that I can put, that I can insert under the skin kind of over your, your pocket in the back, in, where, where your pocket is in the back over your butt. It takes about five minutes um, and it's relatively easy to do, it's not painful, but it's relatively expensive. Uh, there are some side effects, they can become infected and the, the effect is very short lived, meaning that three or four months later I gotta do it again. So it's a little bit of a nuisance. So we, we've got some work to do on testosterone replacement and that, that, that's, that's gonna come with some time, but um, Right now, the standard is these topical gels, the injectables, and the pellets. And the majority of the patients that I see who need testosterone replacement are all um, being treated with, the, um, with the, the injectables. It's a nuisance, but it's probably the most effective way right now. Are all those prescription? They're all prescription, absolutely. Um, so hormonal function is key in overall health, vascular, bone and muscle health dietary health, mental health, and sexual health. So again, testosterone and, and hormonal function is extremely important when it comes to this process. So again, normal erectile dysfunction requires three interacting processes, blood flow, nerve function, hormonal function. And most, um, most erectile dysfunction is vascular, but there's usually a combination. There's usually more than one issue going on. And that's why I look carefully in men. I don't just, if I see somebody who's obviously got vascular issues, I don't stop there. I really wanna make sure that they have normal hormonal function and normal nerve function as well. So how do we evaluate someone with erectile dysfunction? Someone's gotta take the first step. I've gotta ask you or you've gotta ask me, one of the two. And so I'm pretty good about asking patients, but even the, the, my partners in my practice are somewhat remiss. Um, you have to have an interest in it, and, and I think if you understand the ramifications of erectile function and, re and erectile dysfunction, it becomes an obvious thing. What I tell patients is be your own advocate, because no one else is going to be your own advocate. It's really important that you talk to your primary, primary care physician or talk to your urologist and say, I'm having this problem. And it, it's, it's no different than diabetes or an elevated PSA or recurrent urinary infections, or kidney stones, or brain cancer. It's the same process. And what I always, what I tell my partners, be an advocate for your patients. And that's what we're here for. That's what we're all about. Otherwise, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be here. So, um, so how do we evaluate erectile dysfunction? It's simple. Um, a patient history and physical exam. So when I see somebody with, with a, who I identify that has erectile dysfunction, or who complains to, uh, to me about it, um, I do a history. And it's, it's, it's focused on the type of erectile dysfunction. Are you having difficulty getting the erection? Are you having difficulty maintaining the erection? Is it a combination of both? How long it has, has it been an issue? That's an important parameter from the standpoint of how I'm gonna treat you. Lo new onset is different than long ac the, uh, long-standing erectile dysfunction. Um, what are the comorbid issues? Are you a smoker? Are you overweight? Are you a diabetic? Do you have high blood pressure? Is there a family history of heart disease? Did your father die when he was 50 of a heart attack? That's an important parameter. Um, that family history there. Pr 
prior treatments? Have you tried uh, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, Staxin, injections? What have you tried to treat? Have you, ha more importantly, have you, have you focused on your diet and your exercise and stress reduction and good sleep habits and all of those things? Because those are important as far as successfully treating erectile dysfunction. Um, so the sim simple history and physical exam, when I do my physical exam, I focus on blood flow findings and hormonal findings. So I look at people, men who have um, an increased belly, might have increased um, belly fat, they're more likely to have, have low testosterone. I check their pulses in their pelvis and in their feet. Now that's logical. If I, if, if you, if you, I can't feel the pulses in your feet, that's a sign that you've got vascular disease in your pelvis. It's an easy thing to do. I put my hands on, on your feet, I can, I can check that out in, in, in 10 seconds. Um, the physical exam is quick and non-invasive and it's usually fairly definitive. Um, to the question that was asked earlier about the x-rays, yes, we, we should be able to do some more definitive testing to accurately identify things. Right now, that's not a reality, unfortunately. Um, blood work and radiographic studies. So primarily the blood work that I'm looking at are certain types of hormonal studies like testosterone and sometimes I'll look at, at, at certain thyroid studies as well. So again, family history can be very important when it comes to this disease process. And I always ask people about their family history. When I hear that both my brothers and my father died of a heart attack in their 50s, um, that, that's a, a, a red flag from my standpoint. And that, that's, that's extremely important. A history, of, a personal history of a heart attack or a myocardial infarction, coronary artery bypass grafting, coronary stents, all of this is very important. History of stroke, transient ischemic attack, which is that kind of mini stroke, or peripheral vascular disease. All of those are very important when it comes to evaluating patients with erectile dysfunction. So again, um, the, um, the, the, the bottom line, evaluating somebody is, is simple and straightforward. It's not, it's not a big deal. It's a quick history, it's a quick physical exam, and I can, I, can, I can tell you exactly why you're having the problem relatively quickly. So what about treatment options for patients with erectile dysfunction? Treatment options are simple and, and straightforward. The majority of erectile dysfunction can be successfully treated. I'll tell patients there's rarely a patient that I have who has erectile dysfunction who can't be treated. Really, the hard part isn't, isn't the treatment. And, and successfully treating somebody, the hard part is me talking to you or you talking to me. That's really the, the, the most um, significant part of this whole process. Um, so looking at treatment again, first and foremost, education. You have to understand why you have it. And I think that goes a long way to successful treatments. Behavioral changes, uh, lifestyle changes are important. Exercise, diet, smoking, stress reduction, good sleep habits. Then there's medications, the external pump, penile injections, and the internal pump, and I'll go into these for a few seconds. So education, a fundamental in healthcare. Um, physicians have a duty and obligation to educate their patients. That, that's why we're here. If all we're here is standing up here saying, lining people up so we can treat, we're doing the wrong thing. We, 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 that, 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 that's not what we should be doing. We should be educating patients, we should be preventing disease rather than just standing up here and treating disease. Um, and it, it's frustrating to me when our healthcare system evolves in this, the, the, the opposite direction, when we, all we're about is treating disease. We should be, be about preventing disease. And that's why, that's why people are here, in my mind. Uh, the treatment of any disease is much more successful in an educated patient. We know that without a doubt, without a doubt. So me taking the time to educate a patient, not just saying, okay, here's your Viagra, is extremely important. So again, diet, exercise, stress reduction, sleep habits, lifestyle changes. Simple, maybe a little difficult. You gotta change your diet and stop smoking and exercise. And, and I don't mean you, you have to run a marathon. I mean, if you have a half an hour of aerobic exercise three times a week, that's a huge plus. If you get out and walk 20 minutes every day, that's a huge plus. Um, I, I don't think these are huge endeavors here. These are things that anybody can do relatively easily. It's a case of thinking about it, and me talking about it, and you making a commitment to it. That's, that, that's what it's all about. And it's true, less than 15% of patients that I see make the commitment. And I always ask patients about it, and I think it's, it's I, I stress it each time, and I don't 
I, I don't want to be a burden to anybody, but I really want to focus on that aspect of things because I really think it's important. And as men, um, we are somewhat remiss in, in focusing on these things. You know, we don't have a, uh, w women are good. W women go to their gynecologist and their obstetrician when they're younger. We kind of fumble along and then our wives drag us in or something along those lines and, and we're already behind. So we need, to, we, we need to change our culture and change our mindset. And, you know, I'm telling my, my, my sons that, you know, when you, you have to have a regular, regular visit with a physician and talk to your physician about your health. That's, I think, uh, an important issue. Um, but behavior and lifestyle, lifestyle changes, without a doubt, is the primary treatment in any patient with erectile dysfunction. So what about medications? Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, Stax, and testosterone are the medications that we, we typically talk about. And those are the medications that, that we prescribe. There are other um, medications that are more natural, that you can get at health food stores, that aren't very well studied, and may have some benefit. Whenever anybody asks me about those medicines, I say that's fine, Take, try them. See if it works, see if it helps you. Um, uh, there are limited studies on those medications, so it's difficult for us to have an objective assessment of those medications. There are lots of studies on these medications, without a doubt. What we know about these four, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, and Staxin, is they don't always work, they can be very expensive, and they can have side effects. And now the companies are limiting the samples they give to us, which I think is a little bit of an issue. And, and we've had discussions with the pharmaceuticals about changing this. Because I think before I'm going to give somebody a prescription for one pill at $25 a pill, uh, they deserve to have some option in, in, in knowing whether this is going to work or not. The primary mechanism of these four is improved blood flow. And if, it's interesting, if you look at the, 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 the data that, that, it's, that um, it sort of supported the development of these medications, it was from the mid-70s. And this led to a Nobel Prize in medicine. And it, it wasn't looking at erectile dysfunction, it was looking at improving blood flow to the heart. But that's a similar thing, and that's what we're talking about today, improving blood flow, whether it's for erectile function or for heart function. But these medica medications were really born out of this research that was done in the 70s. Testosterone, again, focuses on central nervous system issues, good vascular health, and when I talked about those, those corporal erectile bodies and how their, their, um, their, their, their overall health, that's the focus of testosterone. So this is the, um, above and beyond the medica medications, this is the external pump. It's a tube that goes on the penis. You pump it, pulls blood into the penis. You put a constriction band around the base of the penis and that gives you the erection. This is a, um, a device that most patients don't like. Um, and I can tell you that unless, you're, you, unless you, you spend 10 minutes with the, the person in my office that will teach you, you'll be frustrated even more. Even the guys that go through the class, the 10 minute class, um, there's some degree of frustration. This is not a great option. Some people use it, some people say it's okay. It is a little bit of a struggle, um, but it, it, it can work. Penile injections, uh, this is, how, did, how on earth did this ever come about? Um, and it's an interesting story. There was a vascular surgeon, and he was doing some surgery, and he was injecting someone's groin with a, um, a, a vasodilator, a, a medication that increased blood flow. And he noticed that this patient got an erection during the surgery. So he saw that, and he went home and injected himself, and he got an erection. And then he went to a meeting of urologists, and there were a couple thousand people in the audience, and he actually demonstrated the, the, the injection on the stage in front of people. It was, it was a pretty bold, daunting move, but penile injections can be very effective. They're safe, they're relatively inexpensive, um, they're easy to do. It sounds, how on earth am I ever gonna do this? It's really not that bad. And, and I can teach somebody in five minutes how to do it. The worst part about it is that a small percentage of patients will get a prolonged, painful, unwanted erection. And if that's two in the morning, you're to the ER. And so when you walk up to that desk and there's that gal sitting there who looks at you and says, what can I help you with? 
that won't be your favorite ER visit, I guarantee you. Um, but it's, this is an underutilized technique. It's been around for a long time. It's safe. You can't hurt yourself. Um, it's, it is a little bit daunting, though. But if we take the time to train you and teach you how to do it, it's effective. So I'll, I'll, I'll put the, the, the burden on my shoulders. And then there's the internal penile pump. This has the highest degree of patient and partner satisfaction. It's a surgical procedure, it takes about 30 to 45 minutes, a little opening in the scrotum, and we put this device in. And it's, it's, it's effective. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not effective for everybody, um, but in the right patient population, it can be very effective. So erectile dysfunction, what we know, it's common, it's easy to evaluate, it's easily treated, and the treatments are usually successful. That's, a, that, that's one of the reasons why I do this. It's, that, that's, that, that's all good from my standpoint. Um, but what we really need to know is that erectile dysfunction is a vascular disease in many cases, just like heart, heart disease and stroke are vascular diseases. So um, in, in sort of coming down to conclusion here, an assessment of erectile status may indeed f uh, actually find uh, clues to clinically silent yet progressive coronary, peripheral, and cerebrovascular disease, as well as to undiagnosed hypertension, diabetes, and other endocrine disorders. So erectile function and dysfunction is important for many other reasons aside from I can't get an erection. And, and I, I've stressed that in, uh, as, as long as I've been doing this. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an unrecognized phenomenon. People look at me and say, well, or it's just a lifestyle issue. It's not. It's, it's, it, it speaks to a much, much more important um, issue in our, in our overall health. Um, the, we know the penis is a vascular organ. Um, without a doubt, this, this endothelial dysfunction is, is what the vascular process is in erectile dysfunction. And we know that the penis is a barometer of cardiovascular health. That's, that's the key point here. So, um, Let's get back to our, our, our patient. This is the guy that we talked about, 45-year-old, diabetic, 20 years, came to me for erectile dysfunction, was, was considering an internal penile pump. And so what we did is we scheduled him for an internal penile pump. It's a this surgical procedure to put the pump in, no big deal. He was a perfect candidate for it. Um, during his routine pre-procedure evaluation, his EKG was slightly off. So they called me and they said, yeah, the EKG doesn't look right. And I, I, I thought about it for a second. I, I, th I was going to say, don't worry about it. Let's just go ahead and we'll get things scheduled. So I called cardiology and I said, can you see this guy? And they said, yeah, send him over. So I sent him over to cardiology and he underwent a stress test. And the stress test, they called me back and said, his stress test is markedly abnormal. Two days later, they took him down and did a coronary angiogram. And the next day, he had coronary artery bypass surgery. So really, the, 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 and the cardiothoracic surgeon I talked to afterwards, and, and he, he asked me, he said, why did, why, why did you send this guy to cardiology? And I told him the, the, the specific story. And he said, and he's, this isn't a guy that, that exaggerates, he said, it's likely that that guy sometime in the next six months without revascularization would have had a massive heart attack and died. So the only thing that got him to the cardiothoracic surgeon was him coming to us because of his erectile dysfunction. That's it. Um, and really, he's the epitome of this talk. This, his, his complaint of erectile dysfunction definitively saved his life, without a doubt. So, and he's not the only patient I have that has gone down this road before. He's, he's one, of the, one of the earlier ones, but he's not the only one. So, um, this is my contact information, and you can always get to me through phones or, or emails or, or, or however you like to, to, to communicate with us. I'm going to give you a chance to ask some questions, and, and I'm more than happy to stand up here and answer questions for as long as everybody wants to sit here. Um, and if, if you want to come up afterwards, I'll stand here afterwards and ask, ask, answer questions as well. Yes? So the question is in relation to um, discussing these issues with insurance companies and Priority Health. Priority Health is the tougher uh, insurance company. Um, I, and I know the medical, the, the, the three medical directors there, I know them well. I was on the pharmacy and therapeutics committee there for a long time. Um, and 
I think, I think priority health um, will be reasonable if, you, if, if things are explained to them. Um, it takes some effort. If we can jump through the hoops, typically we can get things done. Not always. And I've gone through some significant discussions with them about testosterone re replacement. Um, specifically in men with what I consider low testosterones, and I'm not the only one that's considering that. I'm talking about um, probably the world's expert in testosterone is a guy in, in, in Boston. Um, and I've had discussions with them about treating men differently for testo in testosterone replacement, and they've refused to do that. So it, it takes some work, both on your part and my part, um, to get them to change their mindset. And if we're not persistent, if we take no for an answer, then they'll say no. They can be a little bit, a, a little bit difficult. I find that Blue Cross is a little bit easier to deal with, but um, there's a lot of patients that I have nowadays with priority health insurance, and, and the reality is I think we have to keep after them. And if you keep after them, I think they'll, they'll, they'll change with time. Next question, what about Medicare? Medicare is actually pretty reasonable. They, don't, they, they rarely refuse things. So I'm, I find them to be very reasonable. You have, to ha you have to jump through some hoops with them, but for the most part, you know, they're so big and cumbersome, they're, they're gonna say okay, much quicker. I'd much rather deal with Medicare than Priority Health, to be honest with you. Yeah. So what, what medications, I think the question is, what medications contribute to erectile dysfunction? Yeah. And you know, we're gonna talk about the antihypertensive medications, the, the blood pressure medications. But let's, let's think about it. Um, if you have high blood pressure, one of the consequences of high blood pressure is narrowing of blood vessels. So when, when those blood vessels are exposed to a higher pressure, there's forces that occur on the endothelium, the lining blood vessels, the, the lining cells of those blood vessels, that causes them to have what's, what's, called, what's called an atherosclerotic change. They narrow. And then what happens, you're diagnosed with your high blood pressure, and you go on a high blood pressure medica medication, an antihypertensive, that lowers the blood pressure, and that lowers blood, th blood flow through those blood vessels. The consequence is that you can't stop the antihypertensive because then you're at risk for heart attack and stroke because you're limiting blood flow to the heart or limiting blood flow to the brain. And you're damaging the blood vessels worse if your blood, your, if your blood pressure goes up. So once you have that process, you have that process. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not real fond of saying that antihypertensive medications cause erectile dysfunction. They can unmask it. But they, but they certainly don't really cause it. That, uh, that underlying pathology is already there. What I will tell you is that when I see men who come into me and complain uh, of, of new onset erectile dysfunction because of an antihypertensive medication, those patients should see a cardiologist, without a doubt, in my mind. Because what you're identifying is a, an underlying vascular anomaly to begin with. And whether it's down here, or here, um, you're identifying patients with a definitive vascular disease as evidenced by their erectile dysfunction as a consequence of their antihypertensive medication. So those patients need to see the cardiologist in my mind. And that's important. Yeah. Not at all. I, I think those, the, the question is, are the medications for erectile dysfunction, what are, the, what are the downsides of those medications? What are the side effects of those medications? Um, all of those medications, because they increase blood flow, people will get flushing of the face. Uh, they might get some blue tinted vision. They might get some change in their, their hearing, uh, stomach upset, nasal stuffiness, back pain. But very rarely do I find patients that, um, that, that have significant, significant downsides to the medication. The biggest problem with the medication, in my mind, is either they don't work very well or they're too expensive. I think those two things. I think the side effects of those medications are manageable. And in fact, um, newborns are treated with Viagra. Newborns with certain types of, of 
cardiac vascular anomalies are treated with Viagra. It's a lower dose, but it's, it's a very safe medication. When you hear the Viagra commercial, they say, if you've got the four-hour erection, give us a call. Well, that's not, I, I think, not with Viagra, but what, with the penile injection medications, absolutely. The, the, the oral medications, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, they're not going to give you a four-hour erection. And I think the, the, the pharmaceuticals say that for its unintended, unintended consequence, like, I want to get that medication. So that, that just doesn't happen. You'd really have to be abusing the medication. He did. After he, he recovered, about three months afterwards, we took him back to the operating room and put an implant in him. He did fine. It does, and it just, what it said was that he had narrowing blood vessels here, which created his erectile dysfunction. He had silent narrowing of his blood vessels in his heart until we provoked him with the testing. So, yeah, I think the, the gist of your question is, well, let's, let's focus on one part of it. You're a cyclist, and putting pressure on the prostate and on those nerves, can that create erectile dysfunction? Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm a big cyclist too. And whenever I ride, I, tell my, uh, I, I always tell the guys I'm riding with, get out of your saddle every 15 minutes and give, your, give those nerves a, a break there. And a lot of seats, as you probably know, have a little split seat where there's a little area in the middle that, that allows less pressure on those nerves. There's a lot of literature that, that has identified men with erectile dysfunction secondary to chronic cycling. Without a doubt. It's a pressure related injury, and it's probably a combination of both blood flow and, and nerve related issues. And then, you, you know, I, what, what I don't want to do is scare the heck out of you. I really don't. Um, and, and I would say that, that, that I'm speaking in generalities here. You know, not everybody is, is, is going to be what this guy was when I talked about this patient that I had. And I, I think you're, you're doing the right thing. Identifying what you have is what you have. You can't change your genetics, but you can change your behavior. You can improve your exercise. It sounds like you already do that. Your diet, stopping smoking, um, following your medication. You don't smoke, so you're, you're doing the right thing. Um, I, I would tell you that low testosterone, if you have low testosterone, supplemental testosterone may be an important benefit to you because of your other medical issues, your vascular health. Um, that, that's an unknown. So the question is, 20 years of cycling, is that, is that going to create permanent nerve damage? That, that's an unknown. And it, it, it depends on so many factors. Um, all I would tell you is that the way to, the way to um, support the health of those nerves, those parasympathetic nerves, is the things I talked about. Good diet, good exercise. When you cycle, make sure that you're, you're getting out of your saddle periodically. Get a, a split bicycle seat. That's all that is, is, is important in keeping those nerves healthy. But are those nerves permanently damaged? There's no way for us to evaluate you and, and tell you one way or the other, unfortunately. You know, we would like that. We would, we, we would like to have that instrument available so that the guy that's had his prostate removed, six months afterwards, he's still not getting erections, I could tell him if, he's, if his nerves are permanently damaged. Because if they're permanently damaged, he may want to consider an implant. Or he may want to just start on injection therapy. And it'd be a nice thing for him to know that right then and there. Who's in generally good health otherwise. Yeah. So the question is, uh, if, if, if all you have is low testosterone, otherwise you're completely healthy, what is the benefit? And you, you, you bring a good point up because what you're going to see isn't necessarily a, 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 an acute problem, meaning you're not going to, um, you, you might not see a, a, an immediate heart-related issue or erectile dysfunction or something along those lines, but because of chronically low testosterone, you're going to have um, a change in your muscular health, loss of muscle mass, increased body fat, and I'm talking over, lo over a longer period of time. Uh, much more significant bone destruction and osteoporosis. Uh, much more, uh, a much higher risk of ultimate heart attack or stroke long term. Much higher risk of developing di diabetes and difficult to treat diabetes. So the fact that you're low now, how it, how it impacts you later on in life can be very significant. And 
you know, we have to we have to weigh the 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 the, the, the upside and the downside of any treatment that we choose for or that a patient chooses for themselves. What are the risks? What are the benefits? And I think we've been we, we've been um, a little bit overwhelmed with the potential downsides of testosterone treatment, prostate issues, things like that, that are unwarranted, and a lot of patients aren't being treated actively. Good. You have to be your own advocate. So the, the, the question is, what, what do I do when my, my testosterone is apparently normal and may not be normal? I think is your is your question. That's a hard a hard issue right now. It's a it's a hard nut to crack because if your if your testosterone's 275, if I saw you with, with symptoms and a testosterone of 275, I'm going to say let's let's go on a three month course of therapy and see what happens. Let's get your testosterone up to 500 and see what happens. There's really no downside to doing that. And if you said to me, you know, I've, I've been doing this, um, I have significant improvement in my energy level, my, my mood, my libido, um, and, and I, I'm not gonna tell you that giving you testosterone is gonna, gonna help you lose weight. But over time, you're gonna see probably less body fat, more muscle mass over time. <laughs> Um, I, think it's a, I think there's a huge upside to that. Um, if you're not seeing benefit, at what point in time do we say enough is enough? It, it, it becomes a little bit of a game um, in, in finding someone who is going to address low testosterone correctly. You know, and I don't like to harp on my primary care colleagues. They have enough things. To, uh, I mean, they are, are swamped. And for me to say, hey, ask everybody about their erectile dysfunction and ask everybody about their testosterone symptoms, I mean, that's kind of overwhelming the, the primary cares. And that's why I think that we've got to collaborate out there and, and, and people need to come to me if they're having that issue. So the question is, uh, uh, the question pertains to evaluating vascular health is, what was, is really the question. And I don't necessarily think you have to, you're, you're going to have trouble getting a blood pressure in a leg. You, you, can, you can do a Doppler blood pressure, but nobody's going to do that. But just checking your pulses is important. What are your femoral pulses? What are your dorsal, uh, dorsal, um, dorsalis pedis pulses? What are your posterior tibialis pulse, pulses? Those are easy to evaluate on a physical exam. I got to do it. And that's an assessment of your vascular health. You know, the question that you asked earlier about, is it reasonable to do some radiographic studies to look at your vascular health? Yes and no. No, because the insurance company's not going to pay for it. Yes, because it can give us an overall picture of you and where you are in your vascular health. And there's more less invasive options that are coming in the future here. Some genetic studies that are being done to look at vascular health. They're, they're going to be out there. So, but yes, you have to be your own advocate. Got to ask. Other questions? Well, I appreciate everybody coming out in the uh, frigid cold here. Um, and I'm going to stand up here for a few minutes. If anybody wants to come up and ask a question, please do. Um, again, thank you everybody for your attention and the questions. And I hope it helps. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.